Good morning and welcome to a new edition of the Arsenal Opinion Podcast. It's a Friday afternoon special and I'm joined by one of my favourite YouTubers, podcasters. I don't even know where we live with this, but I watch you on YouTube. I've got Sophie from Highbury House. Welcome to the show, Sophie. Hi, how are you? How's it going? Salute salute you too. At ease, everyone. That's how we rock and roll over at the Highbury squad. Um, thanks for having me. You too. Not only one of my favorite YouTube channels, but my favorite people. I, th- I love you guys and uh, you're my favorite, but don't tell the other two. I will not. No, we appreciate that. And uh, it's always great having you on the show. Um, love to see the success. Love seeing the squaddies. They're always so welcoming when, whenever I get to um, chat with you and Kev. Uh, I love the get up today. Uh, if, if you, if, is this how you just dress up? Is it Friday feeling? Are you going <laughs> out somewhere fancy tonight? What's the what's, what's going that, on? Is that it's just a Friday, you know, regular Friday here in uh, LA. Uh, but yeah, no, it, I like uh, you know dressing up. Um, Pedro has really lost its luster. I grew up in a time. I used to love watching my mum and dad get dressed up when they'd go for dinner on a Saturday night. I mean, it would be suited, booted you know, the whole nine yards champagne before they left the house. And, uh, you know, it was just a fashion is important. Dressing up is important. I feel like we've gone a little lax. Do you agree that it's a bit lax? I I agree. Like the, the emergence of like street culture and um, people's obsession with sneakers kind of uh, took a bit of the glam out of life. Mm. In, I, I dress up and in, in when I lived in New York, if I would go out on a date or something like that, I always wear a shirt and I like the collars and I like the bars and the shirts. And but people would be like, "Whoa, you you've dressed up. You don't often see that." And I'm like, "It's you never. I never would feel too overdressed." Yeah, anywhere. I think it's uh, like the, the 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 ensemble that you've got there. It's like says something about you, right? Just a <laughs> t-shirt and a pair of jeans and sneakers. Like it's it's not really for me. Yeah. Don't get me wrong. I love, I think streetwear fashion is cool. Um, but I also don't like how now every guy on a TV show with his suit wears trainers. I, I, I appreciate it. And there's cool trainers and it looks good with a suit. And, you know, I like it when it's less with the jacket. But what happened to the brogues, you know, and those Chelsea boots and the brown leather and all that type of stuff? Thankfully, Thierry Henry is continuing he always looks superb on the uh, CBS broadcast here in the United States, keeping it He's real. He's very well king. tailored. Very well yeah, tailored. He is. I lo- yeah, yeah he is. like I I love um, buying like Crockett and Jones is my mm. my shoe brand, and you buy them, and then they they last forever if you look after they them. They do. Sneakers yeah. not not the same. I, we should talk about just uh, because you know m- me and you are uniquely living in in America, talking about mm. an English football club. I think the CBS show, I think that everything they do in football is exceptional. I think it's the benchmark. I think that Champions League show that mm-hmm. they do with Thierry, Carragher and Abdo is phenomenal. What yeah. is your take I, on that? I totally agree. And my friends get a little bit jealous because I send them clips. Hey, CBS, don't come after me. It's just on WhatsApp. I don't post them generally. Uh, but the team over there, I'm a huge fan of Ivas Galasep. I've been a massive fan of Ivas for a long time. He's taught me a lot about U.S. soccer and his soccer brain when it comes to the men's national team, especially, has educated me. There's a great team of people over there who I think are doing a brilliant job. Not an easy job to put out that content every single day as well with some of their other programs. But the Champions League show, Kate Abdo. Take a bow. She's brilliant. As a female broadcaster as well, just as a broadcaster, she's exceptionally talented. Her timing is impeccable. The the fact that she speaks as many languages as she does and how she manages those three is just television gold, really. Um, You've got the arrogance of Thierry. You've got the comedy of Micah. And then you've got the lost child, as she said, like, Jamie Carragher. I'm not the biggest Jamie Carragher fan, but in that environment, um, it just works brilliantly. And I think that they just allow more time to talk about football. Don't you Don't you think? It's not, you don't feel like, oh, but, you know, it happens so quickly. We have to go to commercial. You really get the intelligence of the guys who have played the game 
um, for the amount of time they did as well. And Micah's youthful kind of innocence sometimes, you know, um, even putting the Arsenal shirt at the Emirates the other day and the fact that they can do that and not be bothered about it. And even Jamie did it as well. I, I think they're brilliant. Yeah, I love them. It's really easy with uh, to, be, to be tempted into believing that that's just mag magic in a bottle that they've got there. Mm. But the craft that goes into it, and I, I think... Kate's ability to rank she's wrangling cats and it's got a perfect blend of like <laughs> very serious analysis but also you express the characters of those players yeah. like, Thierry Henry is a different personality on that mm -hmm. show than what he was on Sky like he's totally. I find him much more, he's like oh he's got a, he's he's a he's very funny you know he's not as serious and then like he you know and that's the environment that they put up for them there that's a great point actually you see and I think she helps bring out their personalities and they bring it out in each other as well. It's uh, yeah, because a lot of people thought Thierry, look, he's he's I know when I when I say arrogant, that's with respect. He's everything to be arrogant about. He's one of the best players of all time. But at, at Sky, it came across like unlikable arrogant for a lot of people, whereas here it comes across as I'm the king in a really cool, sophisticated way. So, yeah, I love it. And before we get into hottest of takes, we have a secret rivalry. The, when, when, we're church and state on these podcasts, but uh, the Galaxy is back. St. Louis had a really good season last year. I feel like uh, I feel like some of our friendship might fray over the season because LA Galaxy look really, really good. Yeah, I t I tweeted you all. I I can't say xed. I xed you <laughs> <laughs> before the match, and I said, "Are we frenemies tonight?" And you were absolutely a hundred percent nailed on on that one. What a game! Firstly, yeah. and this is maybe the point where some Premier League or European uh, league fans are thinking, "Oh no, they're going to talk about MLS." But oh no, we are. And it is fun and it's exciting. And when you see new teams like St. Louis, your team, Nashville, uh, what's happening in um, what's happened in, in Atlanta over the years, Austin, what's going on down there. It's really just what LAFC have done since they've been in the league with fan engagement and fans oh. in stadium. I would put up a lot of those stadiums and a lot of those fans against any Premier League they make a lot of noise and they get behind their team. Um, and it's really fun to see LA Galaxy good again because it's been bad for so long. Even when Zlatan was there, it wasn't that great. But what Zlatan did was infuse that rivalry with Carlos Vela at LAFC. They couldn't beat him for so long, even though LA Galaxy were bad. Yeah, I've loved it. I've covered it since Beckham was there. Um, and to see the evolution and the change across the United States, um, it really, truly is brilliant to watch and uh your guys got a little bit dirty the other night <laughs> it was it was a feisty game it was a feisty game i mean the that that i tell you your your boy paint still has got pace for days it's not often you see a, a player at any in any elite sport uh with with those sorts of attributes he's going to be a problem this season yeah, I mean, your whole front three and Ricky Pooj uh, it's just i mean it's a really good team to look at very it is. fun like um opposite styles um, but that's what made a good game, right? I thought. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I loved it. And uh, and the drama at the end, it was just absolutely brilliant. And yeah, Ricky Pouche, for those, you know, he's a La Masia graduate. It was fun to see when into Miami came into town. Uh, Luis Suarez was great with him. It's like he was hugging his little brother. Messi gave him a little hug, but kind of, you know, waltzed off pretty quickly a la Messi style. But Jordi Alba and Busquets and Suarez, it was really cool seeing them um, reunite with their little brother from their Barcelona days. So, yeah, good stuff. And I, I don't want to be a salesman for MLS, but I do work in it. I, I tell you, there are some very good players coming mm. into the league. The level has moved up. I think the 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 very specific fan identities at each club, like it's, it's interesting. I travel all around the States. I haven't been to um, Galaxy yet, but... Austin fans make noise like um, that you would expect at Crystal Palace. St. Louis mm -hmm. fans make noise like the 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 supporter sections are something that the Premier League could just 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 put them in. Have us have a section for the noisy fans. Let them bring their tifos. I mean, some of the tifos that have come out of LA have been mm. absolutely world class. They turn into viral memes. So it's interesting that now we're getting to a point where MLS could teach 
some Premier League clubs um, a few things about atmosphere and like fan engagement, but the quality of football, it reminds me of early Premier League. Like you've got some mm. of the sort of older stars, but that's not the dominant force. Now you're starting to get the 26, 27, 28 year olds in. Yeah. And some of the young Argentinian and South American players are seeing MLS as a first port of call. So you're getting um, some super talents that end up going to Europe. So I think it's an exciting, fun league. And like the build to 2026 is going to be a, it's going to be a fun one. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I look at someone like Paintsill who played at Genk. He's a, you know, Thomas Partey's uh you know, uh, international teammate. I think to myself, you know, Burnley and Luton and Sheffield United could do with him right now. You know, that type of creative point of difference player, creative, fast paced, um, you know, player. I see it across the league because there's always this argument. Oh, would, would an MLS team beat a Premier League team? I, I would say right now, there's maybe a couple of MLS teams that could easily challenge those bottom four to a good game, whether they could do that over 38 games in a season, you know, that's still questionable. But I also don't think why we have to compare. Why can't it just be what it is for American fans? It's the same with with, with Liga. Everyone poo poos that as the Farmers League. Well, French fans love it. You know, sometimes we have that elitist attitude because we see some of the best players and because the Premier League is so exciting, the history behind it, all with the teams who've been around for like 100 years. The, that I think is what what the difference is, but yeah, I'm 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 loving it. I've enjoyed covering it. To see it grow the way it has is amazing. And let's be honest, Pedro, I would never have been able to sit at a table and interview David Beckham, Zlatan, Frank Lampard, Stephen Gerrard, Andrea Pirlo, David Villa. Um, I just would never have had that opportunity if I was in Europe because it's so much harder to get those opportunities. And one of the one of the great things the clubs do is give that accessibility to the media and support them as much as they support the teams in their coverage. Yeah, I agree. And that's a, that is quite the roll call of names as well. Like you forget that. Some of that. <laughs> I, I actually saw um, Pirlo when I, I lived in Soho in New York, he was just mm. strutting down the street and I was like, that is a, a very handsome man walking towards me. And I was like, oh my God, that's, that's Pirlo with shopping bags. Um, I also think with the Premier League point, I remember being a Premier League fan when we were the fifth most important league in mm. Europe. Like we forget it was, and the Premier League started up, it was a fun league to watch. And then it started developing into the quality. And it's only really the last sort of, six, seven years that Premier League has been the absolute dominant league in the world. So if Premier League fans would be well to not throw too much shade at other leagues because as a, as a English fan, I remember when people used to laugh at Premier League and it was Serie A was all the chat. Mm -hmm. All right, let's get in to a little tradition we have on the show. Hottest of takes. Hottest of takes. The hottest of takes. The AOP. Hottest of takes. Make it spicy been a while since you've been on the podcast Sophie where are you going to take this week's hottest of takes <laughs> how about a little peri peri sack of sauce eh? oh yeah <laughs> I was gutted that we didn't get a spicy sauce for, for the show now sack is still on the thunder you need to get Nando's to sponsor that sec this section um yes. and stuff uh my hot take is the international break at this point in the season why 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 it's derailing what's happening in the Premier League. And let's not, let's be fair, it does the same to other fans in Europe as well. We're at that final act of the season and it just kind of ruins the momentum. Although I will say that maybe for us it came at a good time because we needed to rest some players. However, there's always that fear of going away, being injured. Um, I think we've mastered the dark arts, maybe, a la Sir Alex Ferguson. You know, Gabrielle pulls mm -hmm. out the Brazil squad. Saka pulls out of the England squad. Um, and, you know, Jesus wasn't picked. Tommy Yasu, of course, recovering from injury. They play behind closed doors. Him and Thomas Partey maybe get them a little fit for the final act of the season. So for me, these international breaks in March, um, I know there's qualifiers going on. I know there's the playoffs going on. Uh, but I think that if you're not involved in that, then leave players at home. Let them rest. They're already playing enough football. The demands on them are insane, Pedro. And for me, we've got to take care of not only the physical, but the mental um, well-being of these players. And so let's, re let's regroup on March and have a brainstorm about how, if you're not in a competition, 
how maybe your country doesn't have to play, although it's all about the money and the FA and uh, other federations uh, need the coffers, don't they, to be able to do other things? Yeah, I th it's such a it's such a great point. And I, I actually thought that once you got X amount of mega wealthy people involved in soccer, that there would be soccer. There we go. <laughs> Football <laughs> that you would have um, that you, you would have them s sort this problem out. Because if, um, I, you know, Haaland could be playing games like Saka, but if Haaland is out for four weeks, Manchester City have a case to say, hold on a minute, international football broke our Premier League season. And mm -hmm. I, I, I'm I, very happy. If if Haaland is not around, I am very, very happy. <laughs> not on a personal level, because, you know, you don't want to take that away from a footballer. But I do, I would like Arsenal, if we're going to win the Premier League, you want to win the Premier League because you're playing against Haaland City and Mo Salah's Liverpool. And mm -hmm. I, I don't, what, what is Gareth Southgate gonna learn about Bukayo Saka at this stage of the season like or, like there's nothing or to learn. even Harry Everyone. Kane to be fair to everyone right what's he gonna learn about Harry Kane what's he gonna learn about any of those kinds of players yeah shouldn't shouldn't this be you know you're heading into the the Euros shouldn't this be about okay if Harry Kane gets injured if Bukayo Saka gets injured who's gonna step up who is mm -hmm. who's who's the second striker um gonna be for England uh, like who who's a a better option at a goalkeeper? Is there someone on the cusp? Like um, the is it Manu from uh, Manchester yeah, United? Manu, yeah. Give him a game. I mean, the guy is absolutely on fire. Can he handle it at international level? Those are the sort of experiments mm -hmm. that I prefer to be seeing. But yeah, I'm I'm with you. Like the the trepidation that you have when all of these players ping out. It was much worse under in the Wenger era because players would always come back broken yep. and go away to bad pitches. But yeah, I think that's um. I think that's a great hot take. Um, my my hot take is, I think, I think our season is not going to rest on Thomas Party or Yuri and Timber. I don't. I think, I don't think we're going to see much of Timber for the rest of the season. And I think Thomas Partey has now officially been ousted by Jorginho, the man who came in to a crescendo of. Um, horrible comments, slander, critique about his mobility, critique about his decline in performances, critique from the Chelsea side. And he has turned it around. And what a player he's become. He he could be one of the bargains of the season that nobody will talk about. I think Jorginho is, a, is ahead of Thomas Partey. And I think if Partey comes back into the side, he might end up popping in at right back to give Ben White uh, a little bit of time off. What do you think? I love this. Uh, Tom Canton asked me yesterday on his show uh, about Tommy Yasu and Thomas Partey and if, you know, having them back, what does that mean for the Arsenal? And in my mind, I'm like, what a great bench. We've craved a great bench, right? We've wanted to be like Manchester City and Liverpool and actually have quality on the bench. Players you know who have performed at a high level and who can come in 20, 25 minutes, shut a game down or help us if we're behind, um, you know, needing needing a goal. The Jorginho thing is just bang on. Um, so many Arsenal fans were up in arms. The Chelsea PTSD kicked in majorly um, with Jorginho, with Kai yeah. Havertz. And I get it, you know, and there are, we, we don't like them very much. And I'm being polite when I say that. And so it's easy to just point the finger. But Let's not forget what he did to England at the Euros. Euros single-handedly destroyed England in that second half. There's there's a reason he was up for the Ballon d'Or that year because it's we talk about not the greatest player of all time who had a great season and that season he was sublime. And since he's come in, the way he can control a game, the tempo of a game, he's a beautiful player to watch as well. And he's got this something Arsenal have lacked over the last few seasons. You know, Xhaka, losing Xhaka, I was really scared. Where's that mental strength going to come from in the dressing room? Because some of our other senior players maybe didn't have that, but he has. And when you add Havertz and him and their mentality, having one at the highest level, I think it's made all the difference. So I'm going to give a red card to Arsenal fans who poo-pooed the Jorginho signing. 12 million bargain. Let's keep him for as long as we can.
Yeah, he, he he has to get a new deal. I think all of this talk of him going to one of the Milan clubs or uh, or or Juventus, so I'm not sure about that. I think he'll definitely be getting a new deal, and it be Thomas Exing. I did want to, I'd like, I thought it was an interesting comment that you spoke about, like the strength of the bench. We spoke about this on the last show, and Arsenal fans are like, "Well, Zinchenko probably won't start next season. Let's get rid of him. Um, Jesus, he's always injured. Let's get rid of him." Do you think the we are at the level where we don't need to sell players like Zinchenko and Jesus and maybe we can develop into a Manchester City, a light, that Zinchenko can be a bench player next year and Jesus can be a bench player. Do you do you think we have to sort of get this idea out of our head that we have to sell to buy and that actually having a deep squad with pure quality from start to finish is, is the objective of where we're going to go? What do you think about that? I think that's a brilliant point. Isn't it funny, two players who were part of our culture shift and our ability to improve competitively on the pitch in their first season. How quickly football fans forget the impact, especially Gabriel Jesus. I think he took Saka and Martinelli's game off the ball to another level in that first season. And even though Eddie came in and did a good job for three months, you know, after that, that time where Eddie just can't pull it off for longer than that. You saw how much we missed him when he was out. Zinchenko transformed us, making us a lot more difficult to figure out and play against. Um, some people think Arteta kind of pushes the envelope too much on that inverted role. But only when he made a mistake against Liverpool, fans turn against him. You know, yes, like Saliba said recently, like Kai Havertz said recently, all players make mistakes. But Zinchenko has been brilliant for us. And they've learned from their time at City, Pedro, how to adapt being on the bench. They know and understand that. And Mikel Arteta knows them very well. And I think with players like that now in his own maturation as a manager, can really kind of talk to them about the role they're going to play. They've seen it before at Manchester City, the formula works. I just don't see in this market where everything is so expensive where are you going to go get two players like that who can either start in games? Let's not forget next season we go again in four competitions. Um, I think they'll have a massive part to play in the Champions League. They've got good experience like Kai Havertz, and that's going to become invaluable if we progress through the competition. They've been there before. They know the tempo of how to play in the Champions League. And I think we've seen some of Gabriel Jesus' best football when he's played in the Champions League for Arsenal. Yeah, Arteta said maybe 18 months ago, he doesn't like to refer to them as subs. He likes to call them impactors. And that's yes. a, a trend that I've heard um, other managers in, in different countries say. I've heard managers in MLS say the similar thing. And I don't know whether I could have agreed with it when it was Eddie Nketiah. It's not quite impactor. Mm. But Trossard is an impactor. Uh like Jesus would be an impactor. Zinchenko coming on for the last 20 minutes um, or to see our extra time, that's an impactor sub. I only think you get to impactors when you get to a very, very high level. Manchester City have a bench loaded full of them. So do Liverpool. Um, we haven't had that for the last 15 years, I don't mm -hmm. think. So it's um, it's incredible how they built this squad. And then you see these these wage tables come out and Spurs have got a higher wage bill than Arsenal. Manchester United have got a higher wage bill than Arsenal. We're still, uh, we're in the top 10, but I think we're like ninth or 10th. We mm. might prep a little bit out. So it's incredible what they're doing. It's like, it looks like it's a, it's a very high quality squad, but not a very expensive one at the moment. Yeah. And uh, Dave Seeger, I was talking to him about this and he was talking about finishers. So there's impactors and finishers. Now we do have players who can come on and help finish a game, control the tempo, keep the ball. And those things are so important. And again, maybe prior to the Jesus Zinchenko arrival season, we struggled with that a little bit um, in the Premier League, especially against like those top five, six clubs. Yeah. And remember, two seasons ago, a finisher was get Rob Holding on for the last 20 and let's get out. <laughs> oh, oh, how we have developed on that front. All right, first topic of uh, discussion today, the Aaron Ramsdale a reassessment 
um, you had Aaron's uh, Aaron's dad on um, and created global news um, when he was being exited from the side. Uh, a brilliant podcast from uh, we forget was that this season? It was this season. It seems like such a long. <laughs> it's like a millennium ago. Um, oh my god! So that you know, I, I, we had David Seaman on our podcast, and David Seaman was staunchly. Uh, pro uh, Ramsdale didn't think that he'd done anything wrong and I don't think he, he did do anything wrong I know that you've been very pro Aaron I just wanted to see like there was a vibe in the Arsenal fan base that we just ended up with two number two goalkeepers now you've seen uh, and now you've seen him post Dubai mm. um, I wanted to get your assessment like what do you think's going well what do you think's not going well and is the jury still out for you yeah. Firstly, when we did that interview, it was not the first time Nick Ramsdale had been on our show. He had been on our show three times prior. And in fact, on one of the shows, he was having problem logging in on his internet and Aaron popped in and helped him log on and, you know, get all his tech stuff sorted out. So a lot of people thought that he was on the show and it was planned and, you know, he was going to say all this stuff. We had no idea. And Super Kev, you know, he played for the club, um, gives nothing but the best of advice to everyone. And if you watch that interview in its entirety, he's actually telling Nick to tell Aaron to keep his head down, keep working hard. He gave the example of when Ian Wright came to the club and, you know, he felt like he had just as much talent or deserved it based on X, Y and Z. And it, football just doesn't work that way. I was coming from it from the total fan perspective, right? Here's a player who helped change the culture of our club along with the signing of Tommy Yasu, Benjamin White. Prior, in prior seasons, Saka and Emil Smith-Rowe were holding that baton on their own. They, The team, literally, they put the team on their shoulders. They were the two players that we could hold on to and still be in love with this club with and root for them. And then the arrival of all these other players really helped Mikel Arteta you know, evolve Arsenal, Arsenal into Arsenal 2.0. The, the DNA of the player profile we were signing changed. Their heart was completely different. We got rid of the apathy. You know, the, and, I, and I don't want to slight on Sogradis and Mustafi and Kalasi Nacional Zil, but maybe those three, you know, they, they kind of thought they were bigger. Zil who was bigger than the club. So then, then you have all these players who come in and show that they really care and they want to be there. And Aaron was a massive part of that. When you see how he performed at Leicester, you know, the double saves at Liverpool, the, the game at the game at Tottenham, the Richarlison moment, you know, Arteta going over and grabbing him and hugging him and Xhaka and them all. This was massive. We fell in love with him. And one of the things that's been really hard at Arsenal, Pedro, is we really haven't had those players to fall in love with. And so now we're finding ourselves in a position where we're actually one day going to sell plays that we love and we're going to be upset about it. Whereas over yeah. the last few seasons, it's been can't wait for them to go, can't wait to get rid of them. So I think Aaron has done well to kind of not do any more interviews, not put his foot in his mouth like he did with the Ian Wright thing. You know, just put, put his head down. He's been very supportive of David Raya, got ripped by a lot of people for cheering for the incredible David Raya save against Manchester City. David Raya roots for him too. The issue I had with it was the manner in which it was done. I think if Mikel had been a bit more transparent at the beginning, without the two goalkeepers, without the I wanted to sub someone at half time, without all of that narrative and just come out and say, David Raya is my number one, I would have I would have appreciated that as a fan more. With that said, he has proven to make the right decision, right? You know, Aaron saved a penalty against City in the, um, was it the uh, Charity Shield? I can still call it the Charity Shield. Um, Aaron's made, off, made some spectacular saves, but the way Mikel wants to play, which has really truly come to fruition even more this season, he seems to be the guy. And against Porto at the Emirates, in the Champions League, in the round of 16, we fell in love with David Ray that night. He had a seminal moment. He needed that. He hadn't had it yet. And for me, Mikel Arteta has been proven correct in his decision for this Arsenal for now. He is the right goalkeeper. The seminal moment thing is so important there because it's like fans don't fall in love with 
goalkeeper's kicking ability. Like you need mm-hmm. you need to see some big saves. But unfortunately, or unfortunately for David, but fortunately for us, our defense don't really give up high quality shots. So he hasn't yeah. really had the chance to flex those um, those muscles like he did at Brentford. But the penalty saves were David Seaman esque. Like they weren't they weren't. I struck it down the middle and they've hit him on the knees. They were big saves, big hands, big reach, big moment. Um, and I also think you know like Kai Havertz was very similar. It's like, listen, I know that off the ball mo- movement is good. I know that you're bringing the best out of some of the forward players, but you cost 65 million. Please give me a goal. Give me, give me something. <laughs> give me like a, give me an assist or give me a goal. Give me something beautiful that shows that that you're the guy. And now I believe he's starting as a lone striker for Germany this evening. Yep. And it's like, it's, it, it, it's great that, uh, you know, it's also good for the, the talent recruitment that, it's not often that there is such um, not vitriol, but such passion for a certain player. And I think all of the things that you listed out there with Ramsdale are highlight one point. He wasn't dropped because he's a bad goalkeeper. You know, this is this is a guy that helped build the connection. He's probably like if you were going to say who who led the revolution of connecting Arsenal players to fans, I would say Ramsdale. He's very mm. engaging with the fans. Um, he made some brilliant saves. You felt that he felt what you did in the stands. When he kept a clean sheet or we scored, he was you on the pitch. And that's why, you know, a couple of people on my podcast said, we won't get over 30 million for Ramsdale. And I completely disagree. I think there'll be lots of clubs interested in him. You know, Manchester, uh, sorry, Burnley spent 20 million on a 19-year-old goalkeeper as James Trafford, mm-hmm. and I think that's been a disaster for them. I think clubs that are coming up will want a piece of him. I think Chelsea might want a piece. I think Newcastle want a piece. Like, how do you? What's the inside take on his future? Because he's he's too good to sit on our bench. I think that's the the problem. He this is what has made it so hard for his family. They all fell in love. It's very easy to fall in love with Arsenal Football Club. Because of the way they treat people when they join, the way they they make players feel, the way that, you know, their day-to-day when they go to training, um, the interaction, you know, it's uh, it's close-knit. Everyone works well together. Mikel Arteta has taken an institutionalized issue and taken it to, you know, another level when it comes to connectivity within the club. And so for them, you know, they felt like Arsenal was going to be the place. And maybe that's naive, but it's beautiful that people still think like that. Families still think like that. We found a place where our son's thriving. We're doing really well. The family is super happy. Everyone loves the club. They go to all the away games. They go to all the home games. Um, And when that is kind of, you know, rocked a little, it throws you. And ultimately, Aaron's a footballer. He wants to play football and he wants yeah. to be England's number one. And there's and and there's no doubt in my mind that he has shown that he can be. So if he does, and then you say, well, Harry Maguire doesn't start, he plays certain man. And maybe that will change when Gareth Southgate isn't manager of England. You know, that favoritism will, will go. Uh, but yeah, I mean, he he feels like he should be number one, and I think he's made that very clear publicly. He's he's uh he's he's always there to support, but how long can you go on being the support of David Raya and then also not wishing or expecting him to get an injury so then you can play? I think also monetarily, he's a huge asset for the club, and I think your lads have way underestimated his market value. Completely underestimated it. I could see Chelsea paying forty million for Aaron. I mean, I know that there's other clubs that have, you know, um, inquired about him, and he, uh, you know, I think at this point, a player like him, once you play for Arsenal, it's like once you, Kevin, I, once you stay at the Four Seasons, it's really hard to stay at the Roadside Motel. And so for him, being at Arsenal, one of the biggest clubs in the world, where do you go from there? You know, he wants to play at the top level and he uh, he wants to prove that he can still play at the top level. So, yeah, I mean, I think clubs will come in for him and I think we'll get a lot more than 25 million. 
And you, you have to, like, some of the, there's going to be some big clubs that are nowhere near Europe this season. And if you are, you know, you, you map, you map talent to what the job is. If you're trying to win the Premier League right now, maybe Aaron Ramsdale isn't the guy that you give a call. If you're trying to get back into the top four, well, Aaron Ramsdale has already done it in mm -hmm. um, a much more junior project than, say, Newcastle. And now he's got a chip on his shoulder. Uh, maybe he has spent a bit of time thinking about some of the things that he can work on. Like concentration is definitely something that I feel he's perhaps struggled with in the past. And time has a way of maturing you. You know, mm -hmm. like Gabriel, we all forget. Gabriel, big Gabby at, at centre-back. Two seasons ago, he had a calamity in him every six to eight games. Even last season, you know, there was always, it always felt like there was a red card brewing or something mm -hmm. like just a moment of madness. This season, he gets dropped to the bench for three games. And has he put a foot wrong this season? He's been if one of you, our best players. He's been one of our best players. He doesn't make mistakes. Um, he scores goals. Like he really reflects the new Arsenal. And the idea that Aaron Ramsdale is just going to be the level that he's at forever is, is, is incorrect. You know, he's going to get better and better. He's younger than uh, David Raya. You know, where was David Raya four years ago in the championship? Mm -hmm. um, so uh, can, can I just add to that too, in terms of what you said, in terms of the mental side is really important because if there's any position in football, when your confidence goes, being a goalkeeper is really hard. It's difficult for, we saw what happened to Kai Havertz as an outfield player. Dude has won the Champions League. You know, he he lost his confidence and you could see that when a goalkeeper loses their confidence and you could see when he came in the game against Brentford, that moment was all about fear. It was a horrendous, unforgivable mistake, you know, at the highest level. But that was all about fear. But what did he do? At half time, that team rallied around him. OK, and they all love Aaron. He's got massive support from his uh, teammates. And he came back and he made two pivotal saves that helped us win that game. That maybe Raya main... couldn't have made. Especially the, wise, the, 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 the Ivan Tony one would have been tricky for Raya, I think. Agree. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. to come back and make those saves shows how he's slowly maturing mentally um, and overcoming the adversity as well. I thought they were those two saves. And you could see with Arteta at the end of the game, right? He went yeah. over and he gave him a big hug. And that was also nice to see um, in terms of the evolution of uh, the decision-making and that between them was really nice. Yeah. I think every Arsenal fan, like, I don't want him going to a, a, a lower club. I, he should be going to a club competing for top four. I don't want him going to a club where he ousts us from the top four. But he should. Yeah, I hope he has a really good career, and he sh he's he's a better goalkeeper than Pickford. Yeah, I and, agree. And maybe Nick Pope is a, a better shot stopper, but all round game wise, like you need more of what Ramsdale's got than 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 what he has. All right, let's move on. Let's take let's take the next topic. I wasn't sure whether to do this because I, I don't normally like I work in a creative field, and I don't normally mm. like talking about other people's stuff in a in a negative light but it's so you know if the prime minister and the deputy uh, and the, you know the prime minister in waiting <laughs> want to have a comment on it i think we can, all can so i'm going to flash this up if you're listening to the podcast i'm flashing up a picture of the little design detail on the back of the latest england shirt by nike and um, it's a st george's cross but it has a bar of blue dark blue and purple running through the back of it it has caused a lot of controversy and conversation and listen kits are produced to create conversation drive opinions and get people to buy them so i want to start off by saying everything outside this kit is a massive improvement i think it's a beautiful design but i want to talk about uh the the st george's cross and what they did to it and I thought um, you're looking great, Sophie. We've just spoken about fashion. I, I would assume you would have an opinion on it. And I, I would love to get your take on what do you think to some of the controversy around this? Is it merited? 
or you know where 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 do you go with something like this i'm stunned by the backlash and that and then again i'm not you know there are a lot of angry people in our world and some of it is warranted and some of it is not and I don't know, maybe because of what I've been through personally over the last few months, I see things a little bit differently. Um, however, it's cr when someone's creative, it's the same thing. Like everyone thought Alexander McQueen was crazy, you know, as a designer when he first came out. A lot of people think that fashion is stupid. A lot of people think that certain creativity goes too far. Um, stylistically altering the flag of a country on the kit. It's still this is still the cross. They've added color. Is it really going to change you feeling patriotic for your country? I guess that's my biggest question. Does that change how I feel about England? Does it change how I root for England at the Euros or the World Cup? If that was Greece or Cyprus, you know, would it change how I feel about those two countries that I just love so much? No, because in my core, I know what I love. And I understand people that have and wear that as a badge of honor. So I get it. I understand that you're upset. And I guess a lot of people have an issue that it's an American company taking liberties. But the FA, trust me, they're not putting anything to market that they haven't approved. Um, and so for me... Yeah. I just think that we live in a time where people are divided and I don't even think it's about the shirt. I just don't. I think it's about a whole bunch of other stuff. And unfortunately, you know, it's uh, gotten to this point where you've got the prime minister, like you said, and other people chiming in. Yeah, I, I've my, my take on this is how can a kit inspire racism? like a kit a little a, a design feature like the the racism and the overtly nationalistic um commentary off the back of it it's a, it's a bit embarrassing it's more embarrassing that i'm talking about it because I, I, I like giving racists platforms <laughs> or the attention they want puts oxygen into something that doesn't deserve it my my take on it though is um for, like you've got very left-wing accounts saying ah it's just a symbol it's like Come on, guys! It's not just a symbol. It's the it's it's the flag of a country, and it might be fashionable in England to not be patriotic or whatever. But the flag is important in nearly every country. If you'd taken a panel of the Italian flag and turned it purple, do you think Italians would be happy? If you changed uh, Brazil's yellow in their emblem to be purple, would they be happy? Probably not. So it's not like a uniquely British thing. But my 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 bigger point on it is. I don't think it looks very good. <laughs> like, <Yeah. laughs> we can be honest about the design. And, you know, um, I don't know whether it's because um, I work in America and see these things all the time. But when I saw it, my immediate thought was this is um, it's something about inclusivity. Like there is a like it's respecting a, a group. It's like an inclusive message. And I couldn't find it anywhere. And then I dug around and I found out that the the, the colors that they've got are supposed to reflect the colors of the training kit of the 1966 Correct. World Cup team. And you're like, oh, my God. Look, playing with a flag is generally somewhere that you don't want to go because it comes with all sorts of triggers for people. But I don't mind taking a creative risk and a, t a creative swing because you are trying to, to do something for the greater good of a certain group or a person or people. But you did all of this. For, for the training kit colors from 1966 who cares about 1966 the sort of people that really care about the flag i don't think 22 year olds are thinking about the 1966 world cup i think it's people that are you know 40 and above that care mm -hmm. about that so you've alienated your target audience with that and i actually had um there's a there's a designer and um that i follow his name's um his name's craig ward like he's kind of, he doesn't know me, but he's kind of like a, a legend in design circles. He's designed a bunch of kits. He's just an unbelievable designer. He's got an incredible portfolio, but he has designed England kits in the past. And he came out with this, um, this comment that I thought was interesting. Former England kit design alumni here. 
I think Nike just need to get this story straight. If it's a message about inclusion or intended to stir up a debate, then own it. They're usually pretty good at that. Don't dismiss it as a playful update. They also said it had been influenced by an old training kit. So the rationale should be clearer. All other thoughts I have are second guessing based on a lack of clarity. So it's, it's for mm. me, like, I don't, if it, if it is about inclusivity, like, great, we can have a conversation about that. But at least it's like, well, we were trying to do it for the people. If it's the training kit colors, here's an idea. Just have a training kit that reflects yeah. those colors. Like, wouldn't that be a more potent marketing message? Yeah, I agree with that. If you want to be super creative, having 24 hours to reflect on it, one of the things I was thinking about was this would have made a really cool ad campaign, right? Ahead of the Euros, they want to sell shirts. By the way, why aren't people outraged about the price of the shirt? Let's. Why don't we start there? 130 for adults and 119 for kids? I mean, that's a lot of money for a shirt. People should be outraged about that. Um, but I would have maybe utilized the theme of inspiration, right? 66 is important to a lot of fans. It is generational. But if you wanted to play around with it, it would have done a really cool ad, something that goes from the eras, morphs into this. You know, it's a new New England, new fans, always bringing people together, that type of thing. So, yeah, um, I love the the quote from the designer that you mentioned. And here's the problem. Since Bud Light, um, lost a gazillion dollars um, on the market and their brand value. I think Nike took a risk as well with the, one of their campaigns with the woman's bra. People are being exceptionally careful, but being careful makes it even more problematic. Say what you mean, do what you say, say what you mean, stand by your convictions. Um, you know, consumers are a lot smarter than that now. And this half assed way of uh, being and doing things or being fearful about being inclusive, people can see through that. So I totally agree with that comment in terms of Nike being a bit more transparent in terms of, you know, what what the theme, um, where the idea came from and what it really means. I think that's really important that they be a bit more transparent about that. Yeah, I agree with that. And to be fair, so not, like I like the I like the shirt. I love the textures. It feels like Nike's back. I mean, the uh, the French kit with the lines that run into the shorts. Uh, Martin Odegaard in a kit that he won't be wearing this summer. Mm. That's uh, <laughs> that is a very it's a very directly inspired by the entire Norwegian flag, which is kind of like for some for some countries you double down on the flag, but England you were like, why don't we redesign their flag? Very odd, very odd. But I'm glad I got your take. That was. Um, that was great. All right, let's move back on to um, uh, some Arsenal topics. Uh, Tommy Asu with the big deal. He got a two-year extension with Arsenal. I suspect that is to bump his pay to reflect his importance to the squad. Um, but it was only a two-year deal with an extra option to Arsenal. Do you think um, this is Arsenal being smart? Um, or do you think the this could be very similar to the sort of Aaron Ramsdale situation and that we will seek out somebody with more availability. Were you excited that Tommy Yasu got a new deal? I'm a huge fan of Tommy Yasu. Not only, um, I come, I cover his old international teammate. I say old <laughs> Maya Yoshida who played for Southampton for many, many years. And I don't know what it is about Japanese players, whoever I meet, whenever I watch them play, there's just something always so much more than football about them, their stories, what they do in their communities. Um, and for Tommy Yasu, this is a phenomenal opportunity to stay at a club he loves. He really loves being in London. He's found a place. And for Arsenal, they're protecting their, their asset as well. He's injury prone, um, which is why I think the deal isn't as extensive as the Benjamin White uh, deal. Uh, but when he does play, he's hugely important to the team. And we've seen him do things in games that certain players haven't done. Um, his signature moment was, you know, how he shut down Mo Salah and everyone loves and respects that. I think he's oh, yeah. improved going forward. I think that was one of his Achilles heel in his um, kind of DNA and makeup. But I think he's important to have in the dressing room, his calmness, uh, his, you know, his humanity, um, everything about him um, that is what makes him up to be the footballer that he is. I think it's a really important signing. And I hope that his injuries are behind him, Pedro, because, you know, we've lost him twice towards the end of the seasons. It's cost us, you know, cult, you know, 
and a culmination of injuries like Parte and and stuff like that. So I'm rooting for him, and I think that I, I I'm happy with the fact that the club have re-signed him for those reasons. Yeah, that, um, I'll make you right on that. And he's another one of these players. I, I I feel like maybe the last ten years, the player that you start with is the player that you fin finish with. Sometimes the player you start with is not the player you finish with because they they got worse in the system. And since Arteta took over, it feels like these players are different every single season. They're always adding um, extra mm. equipment to the machine that they have. And Tommy's ability to play left, left side, right side, uh, to play centrally, um, to drop into midfield, to contribute to the attack. Like, it's been a joy to watch. I mean, these guys are obviously very dedicated to the profession. And it's fantastic that Arteta is always thinking about what what can I add to your game that wasn't there before? And that's that's mm -hmm. a that's a pep quality, right? That's a you know yeah. his players go through all sorts of um, like different you know different phases of their career, and we've got that at Arsenal. But I think you're right from a cultural perspective. Again, different type of culture, um, the different type of cultural impact. But I feel like he is about hard work, focus, and mm -hmm. you know continuous improvement. Totally agree. And play, young players can learn from that. They can learn from Tomiyasu. And uh, and it's not like, uh, you know, like I said earlier, there is going to be a time where we're going to lose players we like. And he may well be that player next season. But for now, I think that he's an important part of this squad. And I'm a hu I, like I said, I'm a huge fan. I love the way he plays. I love the way he approaches the game. Um, and Arsenal was smart. How many times have we been in situations in the past, Pedro, where it's like, oh, my God, they hasn't signed a deal yet. Oh, dear, he hasn't signed this. We've just allowed players to leave for nothing. Nothing. Lost millions. You like know, no it's strategy, not just, no thought about none. how do we pay this person. None of it. And when you talk about Arsenal 2.0, it's not only the manager, it's not only on the pitch. And, yeah, I was critical of him at the start. And Kev always used to say to me, Soph, wait till he has his own players. And I'm all for, um, I've long said a team is the image of their manager. You see that yeah. with Klopp, with Pep, with Conte. You know, you've seen it with Ancelotti, uh, other than Everton, um, is an image of the manager. And this is what we've seen at Arsenal right now. And the fact that he had to clean up that mess, Emery wasn't allowed to do it. But Mikel's been given the keys to the kingdom, but he has made great use of the keys. He's opened the doors and he's been unafraid to just clean house. And, you know, it's amazing how much we've just wasted. There you go. Take him. And they didn't. And they and the fact that the owners supported that, knowing they were going to lose millions of pounds, just shows you how much they believe in the vision and whatever PowerPoint presentation Arteta showed them back in the day, they've, they've been yeah. all in since then. The but, um, yeah, yeah I, I I agree with that. I think Arteta, like the difference between Arteta and Ten Hag, and you know, Man United fans are like, well, you know, we've got to do what Arsenal do. You've got to keep on giving managers time. It's like Arteta always did a good job. It's like, give me some money and I'll show you what the phase looks like. And there was always an improvement. You know, people say, well, the second season he finished eighth. Yeah, okay. Well, let's contextualize. The first half of the season were, was players like Meza Ozil trying to down him. Um, and then he got a creative player in the mixer. And then he realized that you can't rely on older players and that the focus should be youth. And the back half of that season, like statistically, we were one, of, you know, we were a top four side. So he's always proved each season that when I add new bits to the system, things get better. Um, I was a little bit worried this season that some of the tools that he'd added to the system might not take us to the promised land. But boy, have I been proved wrong on that front. Kai Havertz is every bit the player Granite Xhaka was. And I think we're now at the point where we can say more. So mm -hmm. yeah, you've got to trust the, 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 the talent of the club, but... Richard Garlic doesn't get enough credit because he was the administration yes. guy who came in from West Brom and he's in the room strategizing how those deals go down. He never overpays for a player. Um, sometimes they'll give more money to a player that they think can grow into a contract. I think case in point is like a William Saliba, a Martinelli. 
and they haven't missed yet. And I'm sure they're going to miss at some point. Like the, the next batch of contracts, I don't even want to think about them yet. But you do worry Saliba only signing three years. But mm. we can worry about that another day. For now, it's a 100% hit rate. We haven't lost anybody that we wanted to keep. And that is amazing considering where we were seven, eight years ago. And the market value of these players. How much is our team worth now in the marketplace? And look, I'm not saying that Caicedo isn't going to be good eventually. I'm not saying that Anthony won't eventually become a good footballer again. I'm not saying that Enzo isn't. When you look at this, the money that they've spent on some of these players, you're absolutely bang on right that we've played, we've paid good value. Kai have at 65 million. And I'm sorry, that is the market value for a player like that who has scored a winning goal in the Champions League. Don't mistake being in a broken system and environment at Chelsea that affects a player like him with being... It's like when people thought that Arsenal were a small club because we weren't doing good, big things in the Premier League. Manchester City are a small club doing big things in football. We're a big club who've done very little in the Premier League and the Champions League over the years. There's a difference, right? We've gone from Kolasinac and Mustafi and Genduzi. And, I, you know, I was a fan of Lacazette. Aubameyang for a while, fine. But he thought he was bigger than the club. Ozil. I know Emery tried everything to get rid of Ozil. And he wasn't supported in doing it because we wanted to sell shirts. And, you know, it was the downfall. Ozil owned that dressing room during that time. And when Mikel came around and he gave everyone a chance and he didn't trust the younger players at the start, he realized, I've got to, rem if I'm going to succeed, I've got to get rid of these players. And it's and been Ozil revolutionary. Thought that he would, Ozil thought that he would uh, he'd drive our he'd test win that. Yeah, he, he did. Thought he thought he would win that off. battle. Yeah, because he saw Emery off. So he why did, wouldn't yeah. he think the same? And I'm glad that he, you know, Aubameyang, people sometimes say to me, oh, you're overreacting about the turning up late to the North London derby and then not doing the, the 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 warm the down training after. He's the captain of the football club. Are you joking? You shouldn't turn up late for anything, let alone a North London derby. And that for me was I supported Obama Yang for a while, but that was the beginning of the end. Removing that from and showing that that's when I changed my mind about Mikel Arteta. That moment with Obama Yang was like, you know what? He cares more about the club, the success team, than hanging on to an individual who may have a lot of talent. It means nothing to him if you don't reach his non-negotiables. And that was the time for me where I switched and said, you know what, this guy's great for the club. And that's the difference between him and Eric Ten Hag. It's like Ten Hag mm -hmm. came in, disciplinarian, I'm taking mayonnaise out of the staff canteen that's going to have absolutely no impact on players <laughs> whatsoever. But he's like, it's my way or the highway. And you're like, okay, well, let's... The play, players are... Like, it's it's very sort of alpha dog driven in a mm. football dressing room. Like, you are either the, the top dog or you're not. And if you get found out, you get eaten alive. Unai Emery, as soon as he put um, Aaron Ramsey and Meza Ozil back in the side, it was done for him because he had no authority. Um, Arteta saw off Aubameyang. See you later. You're done. And I'm sticking to it despite the pressure. Saw off Ozil. I'm done. Ten Hag uh, is like the disciplinarian. Rashford goes to a uh, nightclub. And let's be honest, to be seen, you're not in You're not in Belfast if you don't want to be seen. And then mm -hmm. a couple of games later, he's back in the side. It's like he doesn't have the authority in the dressing room. So... Um, yeah, Arteta, he's a, he's a bit of a, a bit of a weirdo. Like, you know, he is very focused. Bit, yeah, he's bit obsessed. Crazy. He's obsessed, yeah, good. but that's what it's you want for right? us. Yeah, yeah totally. For us. Rebecca Lowe said that when she ever, whenever she speaks to him, she visualizes to do his to-do list and it's number one, Arsenal, number two, Arsenal, number three, Arsenal, number four, the wife. And it's just, it's great because that's, you know, he, you need that. You have to be all consuming. And the thing about Ten Hag, just to add to that, he, he never removed Ronaldo. He gets credit for that. Ronaldo removed himself by doing the interview with Piers yes. Morgan. He yeah. had nothing to do with Ronaldo leaving the club. Ronaldo was in control of that situation. Um, and yeah, I, I agree with you. Those are the differences between, between the two. And how happy are you that we don't have players who go off and get caught hanging out? This is the other thing that he removed. You know, Genduzi now looks back and says, 
I'm sorry, I screwed up. He's grown up a little bit and he realizes that the manager was right all along. And we don't have that in our in our squad, which I think you, is so important. You remember the Gwendozi fan club? Everybody's saying that he was better than what we have. Don't hear too much from those guys right now. Um, all right. Um, final topic of conversation for today. Manchester City is looming on the horizon. We've got some players pretending that they're injured. Uh, we know that they'll all be there lining up. Wanted to get your take. Like an, a big away game. We have not won a big away game this season. Manchester City have been the monster under the bed for a very long time. Is this Arsenal team good enough to beat them away from home? And do you have any concerns about, you know, kicking off after a break straight in with a big, a big, big game like this? I would have preferred one game before this one. I really would have. Just to get our feet under the table again. And it's not like Dubai where they were all together for that break. You know, they've been separated. And that Porto game was so massive. Those league games, the the wins, the last minute header from Havertz, you know, those are massive moments. But I think this is the game where we show if we've matured mentally. For me, Arsenal will win and lose both cups, um, both trophies on mental. I think we've got such a talented team that knows um, each other. We play beautiful football since Dubai. We've taken pra the pragmatic approach from earlier in the season and added our speed back, a little bit of that flair, unleashed Odegaard again. Um, it's been really beautiful to watch. Mentally, we're going to learn a lot about Arsenal on that night because I think year on year, losing out in the Champions League to Tottenham, had to come back, improbable run in the league, came back, now lost it in horrible fashion last season, blew it really, come back and we're still there. Every single season in those three seasons, we've shown mental maturity. So the, for me, it's the narrative will change uh, for fans, for us and for everyone who has enjoyed us being the dartboard and them throwing the darts, beating Manchester City. This is huge. And I think if we can beat them, we will win the title. Because that type of mental improvement, that type of feeling, once they do that, I I believe they believe this season. They didn't last season. They didn't the yeah. season before. You beat Manchester City, you take that belief to a whole other level. I can't see us losing the title if we beat them. But, you know, we don't like it when they breathe down our necks. We don't like being the hunted. We like being the hunter, and that's worked for us this season. That's the next step, Pedro. Can we overcome those obstacles when the spotlight is on us? Have you been thinking a little bit about Manchester United, Mark Overmars, 1998? Have you been, have you had any, has it flashed into your mind at any point? You know, those moments always do. Signature moments. And we've had them as a club, you know. And I know that we sing the song and, you know, we won the league at, Shite Heart Lane, we've an old Trafford and um Liverpool. And this team can have a moment like that. They really can. But we've still got tough games. We've still got a North London derby to play. With a pretty decent Spurs side. You know, they, they score goals. They're vulnerable. That that we could really punish them um on the counter attack. But we've got to play Aston Villa at home. We played horribly against them this season. But mm -hmm. we've also been a, a team of justice and vengeance this season. Yeah, great you, point. You, you come at us, we're going to pay you back. And that is a mental maturity um, element as well. So, yeah, I think about those moments. And I think if they can have – that we had it against Porto. But everyone's going to say, oh, it was against Porto. It was on penalties. you still got to save the penalties. you still got to get it to extra time. you still got to manage that game. But we're talking about Manchester City. We're talking about – you know, beating Klopp and Pep Guardiola to a title. I think if Mikel Arteta does that, more so with the Champions League, if he delivers the one that everyone bats us with, you know, the, the the teasing of opposing, your European pedigrees, crap, the last time we won anything, Super Kevin Campbell was in the side. If we win the Champions League for this generation, I put it, that is their Anfield 89 Invincibles moment. That's how much of a pedestal I would put that 
in an era of Pep Guardiola, Carlo Ancelotti, by Munich. If he pulls that off, whew, legendary status. You you just ramped up the excitement now for this game. <laughs> you know, um, I, the, the Porto game was actually uh, a bit of a tipping point for me because it showed that we could scrap. And I know that mm. yeah, we've had scrappy games, but we've never had, we haven't had a lot of high level scrappy games like that, where it's a slugfest. And Manchester City are always, they're like that. You remember that Chanel advert where the guy comes on and he says, I'm not going to be the person people expect me to be. That is always Manchester City. Mm. Like we we go there and we think they'll they'll play football. Um, you know, it'll be tikka taka, like this is how it's gonna go. And I I think they're gonna put a slug fest on us. I think it I think they're gonna be overtly physical. I think they're gonna try and rough us up. I think they're gonna play a, fo a formation that we don't expect. Um, I think they show I think they will show us a level of respect maybe we're not thinking about. And I think it's gonna be a brutal battle of dark arts and the difference between Arsenal and Manchester City at this point, it's less about players for me. It's more about these guys do it all the time. This is mm. just, this is a, this is a nice, this is a nice weekend out for them. We've, we've not been in these situations a lot of time, but we, you know, the vengeance point is key for me. Remember the pain of what they did to you last year. Remember that pain and take it into this game. And I feel like, the other point we, we like to chase, and I know that we're top of the league, but nobody believes we can do it. Nobody believes. Everybody's like, third's fine. Third's fine. Let Klopp have his season. Pep does Pep things. It's like, I, I love that underdog status. And I yeah. think that that could be really strong for us. You mentioned the dark arts. I really believe for the Arsenal, the dark arts are rising. Benjamin yeah, White, Kai Havertz. I mean, Kai Havertz... His dark, how he didn't get sent off for pushing the coach of Porto. I mean, it, I'm not saying for that, you know, if you get two yellows, whatever. How, how he didn't get a card for that. He is brilliant. I thought Benjamin was great at it, but Kai Havertz has just been superb at it. And we're going to need the dark arts that night. And you're right, they'll come at us with that. Oh, but our great. dark arts are rising. Yeah, I think I'd we agree could go toe that. to toe with them. Yeah. And the good thing is we're going away to Manchester City and it's not how many are we going to get beaten by. It's going to be, this is this is a genuine box office game. It's going yep. to be the peak of European football. Two heavyweights, now heavyweights, slugging it out for the Premier League title. And five years, I, honestly, I, I've said this on podcasts before. I, I watched, I've watched Champions League games, Champions League finals over the last five, six years. And I remember watching some of the English ones, some of the, you know, with Spanish teams in there thinking, we are so far away from this level of football, this mm. level of tactical thought. And now we've got the players, we've got the coach, we've got an incredible fan base. Like it just, it like you've got, to, you've got to cherish it because when it went away before, I wasn't expecting it. And now it's like every single game, like this, everything is good right now. Like, don't get angry about the small things. Where we are right now as a club, there's going to be some pain, but like we are competitive and that's all you ever ask for. Yeah, it's a great point. We've craved com uh, to be competitive again. And here we are just to be in those moments. A lot of jealous years, but here we are. Let's make it count. Well, Sophie, that takes us to the end of the podcast. Uh, thank you for coming on. You're an awesome guest as always. And where can people find you on the social and where can they find you on the YouTube? Thanks for um, having me. Really appreciate it. We're at Highbury Squad on the old X and on YouTube. Uh, come give us a visit. Check out our content. Uh, we've got some good stuff rolling, good guests. Uh, we just don't, you know, do post-game stuff or tactics. We like football conversations and... Uh, yeah, give us a go. Let us know what you think. We and appreciate a top -tier the community. shout out. You've got a very they're, engaged they're great. community. They're yeah. great. This is why I've got the cards always handy. You've got the the red and the yellow and stuff like that. They often get carded, those buggers. <laughs> I had a, I, I worked with a creative director once and he'd have cards at his desk. And if you showed him a bad idea, he'd give you a yellow card. <laughs> <laughs> you probably, probably couldn't get away with that in this day and age, but it was a good one. All right. Um, so make sure you check that out. The links will be in the bio. And remember, uh, if you want, uh, if you like listening to this podcast, and if you like hearing from Sophie, give us a five-star review and leave a comment. And uh, I'll be back later on this weekend with a Patreon Q&A. 
And on that note, have a great weekend. Uh, we're about to go into battle. Take your time off. Refresh yourself. Thank you, Sophie. And on that note, I'm going to say ciao for now. <laughs>